Thank you, Kim, for that introduction and welcome to this presentation on amplifying your genealogy research with the Arizona Memory Project. My goal today is to help you realize the potential that the Arizona Memory Project has in assisting with uh, your genealogy research uh, when you have Arizona ancestors. Um, I'm going to give a couple little caveats here. I do have two large dogs that are many rooms away, but they're very large. So you might hear them bark because if a leaf moves, they like to bark. Um, also, we have cats that like to run around and you can see one right here. So if you're a cat fan, there's one for you to look at there. Um, moving forward with the presentation, I do tend to call the Arizona Memory Project AMP for short. So just to clarify that um, in case there's any confusion about that. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this slide since Kim already gave a wonderful introduction, um, but I do work on our digitization workflows um, with our in-house material. So that gives me kind of a unique perspective when it comes to the items that we have on the Arizona Memory Project from our own collections. Um, and there's a lot of material on there that I think would be very beneficial if you're doing any genealogy research about your Arizona ancestors. Um, as mentioned, I also am responsible for the content on our social media channels, and if you don't follow us, please do. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We also have a blog, um, and I try to um, share items from the Arizona Memory Project in particular. So um, those items that we think we will find um, interesting, useful, it can be newspapers, it can be documents, it can be all sorts of things. Um, this particular presentation, because none of this is proprietary, because it is a, a state agency information is being recorded and we will get it up on our YouTube page. So another reason to follow us on YouTube. Um, in the coming days. Brandy, this is yes. Kim. We're seeing yes. your notes as well as oh. your slide. I didn't know if you meant for us to no. read along with you. Let's try something else. Let me turn the yes. presenter view off. And it looks good. How about that? Is that better? That's perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Let's skip ahead. So just to kind of give you some information about the state of Arizona Research Library, we are uh, a part of the Arizona State Library Archives and Public Records. Um, think of us as a, a branch of the state library. There are several other uh, branches, including the archives. Um, and the division of the Arizona State Library Archives and Public Records is part of the Secretary of State's office. So essentially we are overseen by the State Library Holly Henley and also the Secretary of State um, Katie Hobbs. Um, we are located at the um, Polly Rosenbaum State Archives and History Building and that is at 1901 West Madison Street. It's just southwest of the uh, state capitol on the other side of 19th Avenue. And that is also where our reading room is, although it is currently closed for the pandemic. Uh, we are seeing uh, appointment based um, research if if that's something that you need, but we've also been very, very uh, efficient at assisting our patrons with um, virtual reference as well. So you'll be able to reach out to us that way if you have any questions that you want answered. Um, the library website is there at the bottom of the slide and from there you can find a way to reach out to us. There's a giant green button on that page um, to reach out to us if you have any questions. So just a couple of objectives that I had for today. I wanna to give just a general overview of what the Arizona Memory Project is. And then I wanna highlight some specific items that I think um, you would be interested in as genealogists. And then the, the second part of the presentation is gonna be providing some search techniques, how to use the Arizona Memory Project um, and search for the items that you, uh, or the ancestors that you're looking for. Um, we recognize that there are a lot of limitations to the Arizona Memory Project and there are um, some tricks to searching it effectively. And that's kind of what I want to show you guys today. So the Arizona Memory Project is a platform for digitized um, historical collections. We have 96 partners and that includes us as our, our own partner. Um, and they provide 250 unique digitized collections. So quite a few different um, collections there. And then we, in addition to that, have about 120 newspaper titles. All of those numbers are growing um, almost monthly at this point. We've been in the last couple of years really ramped up 
on the number of collections and newspaper titles that we've been adding to the Arizona Memory Project. Um, it's been around since about 2006. Um, there are items in multiple formats. You can find oral histories, photographs, newspapers, um, documents, all kinds of different material. Uh, and in my opinion, I, I find that it is a uh, genealogy gold mine. There are roughly 600,000 individual items currently on the Arizona Memory Project. And to reach AMP, you can get to it via this uh, link here at the bottom. Um, you can also get to it from our state of Arizona research library page. So just um, kind of briefly talk about the collections that we have uh, on the Arizona memory project. When you land on the main page, this is what you will see. Um, and you have, we have these large kind of buttons. We tend to think of them as, as buttons or subject um, buckets. And if you are interested in just looking at photographs, you would start here, maps, you could start here. So this is just a general get started page. Uh, on the next slide, I'll kind of show you a way to find um, uh, all of the collections here. So I just have a couple videos on some slides to kind of navigate you through the website. Um, so again, these are kind of our main topic buttons. If you were to click on one, it takes you to a directory of the collections that are tagged with that particular subject. So in this example, Arizona history and culture. So these particular uh, collections, if you scroll down, will be in alphabetical order. Um, and then you can click on another uh, subject if you wish to look at the photographs. And again, these are all of the, the collections that are tagged with the, um, with a photograph, meaning that the collection is based in, in photography or, or photos. If you want to see all of the collections that we have, um, we, there's a different way that you can do that. And the collections contain things like books, documents, again, pictures. We have court records. Um, we have yearbooks, directories, and then we have a lot of collections that are um, mixed in nature where they might have photographs and um, other material. So to see all of the collections, you'll use that menu button in the upper right and go to collection directory. And this is where you'll find all of the collections that we have. We've also tagged collections with smaller, um, more precise subject headings, which you saw there at the top. And when we click on the ones tagged with women, you'll find collections that are focused um, about uh, Arizona women. Um, and then you can see additional browse topics there at the top. And then the rest of the, the page is all 250 collections in alphabetical order. So. If you're looking for something specific, um, sometimes the easiest thing to do is maybe like an F3 search on this page. That's usually how I do a quick search of the collections. If I'm looking for, you know, something about Tucson, I might hit hit F3, which will pop up um, a search box for that page and find all the times that the word Tucson is used in uh, our our collections. So we, again, as I mentioned, have 96 contributors. Um, those include museums, libraries, both public and academic. We have archives, um, different organizations and foundations, um, cities, counties, and state agencies, private businesses. And just in the last year, we've started working with some um, private collections that were uh, kind of curated by maybe family members uh, over the years. Um, and I'll talk more about that uh, in a slide a little bit later. To see the full list of contributors, again, you'll go to that menu in the upper right and click on contributing institutions. And these are all of the uh, partners that, that we work with. They are also listed in alphabetical order. And you can see that um, in addition to information about them are the list of collections that they have submitted um, to be included in the Arizona Memory Project. The other way that you can find a contributor is by going to the contributor map. And this is a map that we've created that you can use to search for collections by a geographic area. So if you're looking for um, collections out of Prescott, you can zoom in on that area. Um, and when you click on one of those icons, it'll give you information about the partner and also provide information on the collections that they are. Um, they have submitted to the Arizona memory project. So just another way to kind of look through um, the, the partners that, that we have in a geographic sense. 
So let's get to the fun stuff of talking about the genealogy resources that we have. Um, this is uh, an image of just an, a very small example of the materials that we have. Um, and today I just kind of wanted to focus on things like our, our brand books. We have lots of directories, government documents, newsletters, newspapers, periodicals and magazines, and then also yearbooks. Um, this doesn't even hardly touch the number of items that we have on the Arizona Memory Project that I think uh, genealogists would find useful, but I wanted to really focus on these things because I think um, this is kind of where we shine. So livestock brands, if you're not familiar, are um, brands that a rancher had to register with the state um, and it's by law that they have to register the, the brands and the ear tags that they use as part of their um, cattle business. We have brand books on the Arizona Memory Project from 1898 to the present. There are some uh, big gaps in there, so just be aware of that, but everything that we have on our physical shelves is now on the Arizona Memory Project, so there isn't anything outstanding that has not been digitized. Um, these, uh, I think, are good for genealogy purposes, if for nothing else than to just see what the brand look like maybe for an ancestor. But you also get information such as the address um, of the, the ranch or the person who had registered the, the brand. Um, you might also get information about a partnership. So this uh, example here at the top is for um, E. Brown. Uh, his father was Edwin Brown, who owned DC Ranch in Scottsdale. Um, and so E. Brown was his son and uh, Mr. Marley, and he had several brands that they had actually registered, and this is one of them. So you see an address um, where this brand was registered, which if you're familiar with Phoenix history is around the stockyards area, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then just another example here at the bottom, we can see two brands. Um, this is from the 1898 livestock um, brand book uh, for the Babbitt brothers, and they have lots of different um, registered brands, but this is just two of them. The brand is there on the far left column, and then the next column over kind of gives an indication of what the earmarkings might look like. So just some kind of interesting um, information on brands that you could get for your ancestors. And as genealogists, you guys all know the value of city directories. Um, we worked with Family Search uh, in 2019 and up through uh, about a year ago when everything shut down for the pandemic and getting um, hundreds of city directories across Arizona digitized and um, being sent home during the pandemic gave us the opportunity to get all of these uploaded to the Arizona Memory Project. So um, currently from our own collection, we have directories from 1881 to 1964. Um, these include business directories, um, personal uh, individual directories um, for the citizens of the city, um, farm and ranch directories like the one that you see here. And some of our directories also include information uh, for neighboring states or even um, larger cities nearby. I know we have one um, directory that includes some businesses out of El Paso, Texas. So even if your ancestors lived uh, Arizona adjacent, you might find some information in some of those directories. There are some directories outside of our own collection. I know Flagstaff, um, I think it was Flagstaff, Flagstaff Public Library submitted a collection um, several years ago of Flagstaff City directories. So this is an example of the information that you would find in a city directory, and this is the 1918 Phoenix City Directory. And in here you can see we have Frank and Tilly Luke, and then their son Frank Jr., and their other son Edwin. Um, and both Edwin and Frank Jr. were in the military, which is what the um, mark of that flag means. Um, and 1918, as many of you probably know, is the year that Frank Jr. Um, would have been killed in action during World War I. So it's interesting to see his name in the 1918 Phoenix City Directory. And then we also have other directories, not just city directories. Um, a lot of these are gonna be in our state documents collection and also in our Arizona collection. 
So this is a directory of Arizona contractors from 1967 through 1968. Um, other directories we have would be for other state agencies or, or state boards, schools and universities often had directories and also for associations and clubs. And this is just an example of the information within that um, Registrar of Contractors directory. You can see um, not only is there business names, but sometimes there's a personal name as well. So you could find both um, types of information in here as well as an address, a license number. There are also businesses listed in here that are not from Arizona, but were licensed in Arizona. So again, if you have um, ancestors that are in states adjacent to Arizona, this might uh, be a good place to look. So our government documents, I think, are a much underutilized resource when it comes to Arizona genealogy. There are tons of different documents that have names and addresses and personal information in them um, that a researcher would find um, useful. Again, those directories that we just talked about, but we also have licensee lists. Um, this is an example of a licensee list in the upper left. This was a list of registered nurses. Um, I can't remember exactly what year it was. It might have been from the 60s. Um, so registered nurses, including their address. So this um, provided some good information for genealogists. Um, we also have membership lists, um, transportation studies, which is not something that most people would think to look at for um, genealogy information. This image in the middle on the bottom is for a transportation study out of the city of Suarita. Um, and this is just one of the documents in that study, which is a membership list. Um, it's a list of people who attended meetings related to that transportation study. And not only does it provide information about their title, how they took part in the study, um, but also who they worked for and a phone number. And sometimes these lists include members of the public who actually attended some of these meetings too. And then we have uh, reports, so things like annual reports um, and newsletters also, um, which we'll talk a little bit more here in just a second. Um, but some of these other documents that we have up in the upper um, middle, this is a um, directory of students that were attending the University of Arizona in 1880 or 1898 and 1899 uh, and includes where they're from and on subsequent pages it tells you what they were studying at the school. Um, this is in the upper right hand corner a page from the La Roca newsletter which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, it gets mentioned a few times but this is just a page um, from the newsletter that shows some of the employees that were working for the state prison in Florence. Um, a directory of um, mining consultants on the bottom left and then on the bottom right, I believe this is from the 30s. It was a list of people and companies who were licensed to um, to haul material or to to ship things and it um, not only tells you who the person is in the company, but their address, what their route was, and then what you can't see on the far right will tell you how many vehicles they actually had, how many trucks they had, and how much they could haul. So newsletters that we have aren't just from the state government publications collection. We also have a, a lot of newsletters in the Arizona collection and um, it's one area that we really want to try to get digitized because uh, we have so much material um, and a lot of these include a lot of information about people that worked um, for different businesses or agencies. Um, so newsletters that we have cover city and state agencies, state boards, school newsletters, associations and clubs. Um, we have uh, newsletters from healthcare facilities and then from the prison system as well. And again, that La Roca newsletter um, is one of my personal favorites. It's a literary journal that was written out of the state prison in Florence from the um, early 1970s through the 1990s. And it was actually an award-winning um, newsletter uh, at the time. And there's information in there, not just about who was incarcerated, but also who were, uh, were employed there. Um, so it's a good resource. Um, Desert Grapefruit was a newsletter um, for citrus growers. It was an association 
uh, of members from California and Arizona. So there's a lot of information in there about people that worked in that industry. Um, the Newsbeat newsletter was a um, Department of Transportation employee newsletter. So it was specifically for the employees of the news uh, of the department. Um, and uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. And then on the slab, which <laughs> we'll talk a lot more about in just a second, was a newsletter. Um, was a newsletter that um, was written by the highway department in the 1950s through the 1970s. So this is just an example of the material inside that Newsbeat newsletter from the Arizona Department of Transportation. This is a whole uh, page worth of information on people who are retiring from the department um, and includes uh, names and personal information about what they did while they worked for um, ADOT and then um, maybe what their plans were after retirement. One thing I want to point out, because we'll talk a little bit about searching for names later, is to note how the, the name is written in this newsletter. Um, a lot of them have first name, middle initial, and last name. So just keep that in mind um, as we move forward. So another newsletter that I find um, valuable for genealogy purposes was this newsletter that the highway department started publishing in 1952 that had the very unfortunate name of on the slab and the newsletter was written as a way to keep track of statistics when it came to traffic fatalities uh, across arizona um, so you can imagine why on the slab is such a um, insensitive title. Um, the title did change in the 1960s, I believe it was, to an even less sensitive um, name of Arizona safety sadistics. Um, but regardless of the, the horrible name that they chose, there is a lot of genealogy information within this newsletter. Um, this is an example from November 1954. And as you can see on the bottom, it lists um, that a passenger was killed and in what county and kind of the circumstances of that um, accident. When the newsletter moved into, I believe it was the 1956, um, it actually started listing the um, person's name that was killed in the traffic accident. And this particular example um, is just a way that we've used this newsletter to kind of tie stories together. So at the top, is a news article from the um, Papago Indian News, which is a newspaper that we digitized and is on the Arizona Memory Project. And in it, it talks about Leonard Dolores, who was um, visiting his wife at Cells, or on his way to visit his wife at Cells, Arizona, and was in a traffic accident and was killed um, outside of Gila Bend. And it actually gives us the date of August 3rd. And this newspaper was from September of 1957. So we went to the on the slab newsletter for August 1957. The date was the third, and then here is Leonard, Leonard Dolores's name. He was only 25, and then it tells you kind of exactly where the accident occurred. So 10 miles west of Gila Bend on US 80. So um, you know the number of materials that we have on the Arizona Memory Project kind of lend itself to verifying other information that we ha have or that you might have found maybe in a newspaper or something like that. Our newspapers are another area um, of the Arizona Memory Project that we take great pride in. Um, of the 600,000 items that are on the Arizona Memory Project, about half a million of those are uh, newspaper pages. Um, again, we have about 120 titles. We cover three different languages, Spanish, English, and we do have one Navajo paper also. Um, all counties are now represented by at least one newspaper. And then we also have um, the collections broken down into special collections and decades. Our newspapers cover the years 1859 through 1989. 1859 is the year the very first newspaper in Arizona out of Tubac. And then 1989, uh, we just uploaded for Women's History Month. It was the Arizona's, Arizona Women's Voice, which was a newspaper out of Phoenix. Um, written for women and was published by women. So that was one we just finished um, this month. So to look at our newspapers, you just click on the Arizona Historical Digital Newspaper button, 
And this takes you to a complete directory of all of the uh, newspapers that we have. And you can browse by location, um, special collection, or by decade. And uh, if you scroll the rest of the way down, all 120 newspapers are listed there in alphabetical order. And then clicking on the link will take you to the actual newspaper. But if you wanted to look at, say, military newspapers, you would just click on that button and it will take you to all of the newspapers that we have tagged with the military uh, tag. So these are newspapers related to um, military installations around Arizona. Um, one thing to note also, the way our newspapers get digitized is typically through a grant with the Library of Congress and the National Digital Newspaper Program, um, but not, not all of our newspapers are digitized that way. So I've seen some mention of Chronicling America uh, in the chat during the previous session. Um, if our newspapers were digitized with an NDNP grant, then they will be on Chronicling America. If it's a newspaper that we digitized on our own, which is what we've been doing for about the last year, they will not be on Chronicling America. So if you're just going to Chronicling America and not finding what you're looking for, I suggest you come back to the Arizona Memory Project because you're going to find a lot more Arizona newspapers here than you will on the Arizona Memory Project or on Chronicling America. And just like with city directories, I don't have to tell you guys how important yearbooks are for genealogy research. Um, this is another project that we worked with Family Search on. Uh, we digitized um, our some of our yearbook collection, and we now have yearbooks online from 1903 through 1987. The 1903 yearbook is a University of Arizona yearbook, and the 1987 yearbooks we have from both Phoenix and Tucson. There are um, lots of gaps in some of those as well. So not every yearbook for every year for every school is online. Um, but this includes colleges and universities, high schools. I believe we have at least one junior high school out of Tucson on here. Um, and then there's also yearbooks um, across the Arizona uh, Memory Project that uh, are for associations and clubs as well. So now that we've talked about some of the items I think that you guys will find useful when researching your ancestors, I want to give you a little bit of some information on how to navigate the Arizona Memory Project, because again, we recognize that it's not super intuitive and that's something that um, uh, we are working on every day, I promise. <laughs> so um, in navigating the Arizona Memory Project, you will land on a page like this with your um, your results and there are two different ways that you might find a document. One is what we call a compound object. Think of it as a file folder with a lot of files in it and it's a way for us to keep all of these Bisbee city directories together. But you also might find an item that's just a single item like this particular directory. You won't see a list of items beside it um, listing other items. One thing you might note is the number of pages and the file size, especially when it comes to city directories and yearbooks, the larger the item is, the longer it takes to open. You can see kind of that moving bar across the top that tells you that it's working. It's trying to open the item, but again, depending on how many pages, it might take quite a while for that to open. So be patient. Um, if you live somewhere where the internet isn't super awesome, it might take a while. On the left hand side, we also have facets that you can use to narrow your search down. So you can look by decade, you can look by publisher, you can look by county or city. So we recommend using those facets on the left hand side to kind of narrow down what you're looking for. And you'll find those facets on all of your search results. They might just look a little bit different depending on what you're searching. So printing and downloading is available for quite a few of the items on the Arizona Memory Project. Um, some of the collections that are provided by our partners are copywritten or they own the copyright to the item. So particularly with images, you might not be able to print or download the item. Um, so if that's the case, you will not see the green buttons over here on the right hand side. Um, if you do see those, Feel free to download the item or print the item. If you want to print a 1400 page city directory, you are more than welcome to do that. Um, also, when you open the item to view it, you can also print or download from that screen also. 
And then one of the newer features of the Arizona memory project is the ability to save items. Um, you do not have to have a um, login. In fact, we don't even have that capability. There's no uh, email that we collect or anything like that. You can use the Arizona Memory Project for free, but we recognize that sometimes after doing all the research, you want to save all the items that you um, have been looking at. And so you can see on the right hand side, these uh, little save stars. If you click on those for the items that you want to save, It'll save them in a unique URL. And to get to that, you'll go to that uh, menu in the upper right, click saved items, and it'll open it in a new tab. And it'll show all of the items that you've ever saved on that particular computer. And then you select the items that you want to save, click on the create link button, and then you have to remind the computer that you're not a robot. Create a link. And then it's going to create this really long, ugly URL that you can copy and then either post it in your notes somewhere um, where you keep track of all of your research, maybe email it to yourself, whatever you um, are comfortable with. But then it saves all of these items for you. So if you need to go back and look at them later, you can. So before we talk about searching AMP and the different ways to do that, just some things I wanted to point out. And I think most of you guys are familiar with um, OCR or optical character recognition and the limitations that it has. Um, we are relying on a piece of software to read the documents that we've digitized and create this um, text transcript. And this is an example of one that isn't very good. <laughs> um, the software needs very clear text in order to read, and this is obviously text that has been handwritten. Um, and if you look down here where it says sort of with every pair, you can see that that is also here in the handwriting. Um, so you can tell that the, the text isn't that great in comparison to the actual document. So just keep that in mind and we'll touch on that in a, a couple more slides. Another thing to note with the Arizona Memory Project is the platform limitations. And this is something, again, that we are um, working on diligently to improve. Unfortunately, in the transcript field, there is a limitation of 128,000 character limit. So when the OCR is applied and put in the um, fields for the Arizona Memory Project, the limit is about is 128,000 characters which is roughly 45-ish pages, depending on the size of the text. Um, however, there are other ways that we can um, get around that, and we'll talk about that in a couple more slides. But just be aware that if you're searching the Arizona Memory Project and you're coming up empty and you're pretty sure that, you know, that name is in a city directory somewhere, it probably is. We just have to um, search in another in another fashion. So when you are wanting to search the Arizona Memory Project, the first thing or the most obvious thing that seems like you should do is just type your search term in that box in the upper right hand corner. This is sort of the general search box that will search all 250 collections and 120 newspapers at once. Um, I'm here to tell you if you learn nothing else from me today, <laughs> do not use that search box. It's very tempting because it's right there on the main page, but don't use that search box or you'll be very uh, disappointed in the results that you get. Instead, click on the advanced search button below it, and that's going to take you to the advanced search page. This is where you're going to be able to really direct how you want to do your searches. So in the top of the advanced search, um, this is where you can select what collections you want to actually search. So if you just want to search the yearbooks or just want to search a certain newspaper title, you can do that um, in this uh, area here. You will have to click the show all button to get the full list of all of those collections. And I am warning that you warning you that that includes the 250 collections and the 120 newspapers. So that list gets very, very long. It is in alphabetical order, although we did put the newspapers at the bottom in its own separate alphabetical order. So if you're looking for a newspaper, just go all the way to the bottom first. Um, and then in the next uh, section where we enter the search term, that's where you would enter your search term in the box here. 
Um, I generally recommend leaving it at all fields, especially if you're looking for a, a name of somebody. Um, but you can change this to things like title. Um, if you just want to look um, for yearbooks, you could do that here. Um, or if you just want to look for subject headings, you could do that here. So you can change this, but I recommend leaving it at all fields if we're doing search for uh, our ancestors. The other important thing that you want to change is instead of it saying all of the words, change that to exact match. That way, if you're putting, um, you know, John Smith, which is a terrible example, but then those two words have to be in that order in order for the Arizona Memory Project to pull it up as a result. So change it to exact match and then click on the green search button. Another limitation of the platform is if you try to add a row. So if you were trying to look for John Smith and doctor, um, the platform cannot do that and search at all. And it turns it into an or search. So instead of getting John Smith and doctor, you're going to get John Smith or doctor. So you're going to get all the things with John Smith and all the things with doctor. So don't add a row. And then I don't use the date. Here, I don't put a date at the bottom here. I use those facets on the left hand side to limit um, my search to a specific date or decade. So the next place that you can search is within that compound object. So if you remember when we were looking at city directories, we talked about how a compound object is like a file folder and all of these items below are items within that file folder. So this is again, La Roca newsletter. Um, these are all of the issues that we have. You can search within just that title if it's, the, if it's a compound object. So if we're looking for Nickens within the La Roca newsletter, um, we can type it in this search box and see that the name Nickens comes up in the January and March issues from 1989 with this red line. Once you open the item and are in the viewer, you can also search in the viewer itself. And this is where we're gonna get around that 128,000 character limit that the metadata has because the full 736 pages of this particular um, city directory were OCR'd. There just isn't room for it in that metadata field. So if you can get to the item that is longer than 45 pages and search in here, then you're gonna find those ancestors that are on page 626, for example, um, of the city directory. So consider, consider that when you're doing your research. If you know that your ancestor worked for, uh, you know, the Department of Transportation or the, the prison system, then maybe look for an item with those words in the title, and then you could maybe use those facets on the left-hand side to um, narrow down to a time period or to a directory or to a yearbook. And then when you open the item, do a search within it to find exactly where they are in those larger items. So even though they you know, have these limitations for us, we have ways of working around them. And this is another example of why you would want to use kind of that search browse technique. So this is an alphabetical listing of prisoners at the territorial prison in Yuma. Uh, I believe the year was 1895 through 1897, if I remember correctly. Um, and you can see that the OCR on this particular item is gonna be good to a point. So the area where the ink is kind of fading is not going to OCR very well. And so we would hate for someone looking for William Arnett to miss out on this document because um, the OCR just isn't that good on that, that document. So this is where you might think, he was a prisoner at Yuma Territorial Prison. Let me find documents on the prison and see if we can find a list of prisoners. Um, and then you can scroll through the item itself and find uh, what you're looking for. So wanted to talk about how to search for names since that's typically how um, genealogists are looking for information uh, on their ancestors. So if we're in the advanced search section, and we're looking in all of the direct, uh, all of the collections, um, and I want to look for uh, someone whose last name is Tyson. Well, that didn't work. It jumped ahead on me. Sorry, guys. Um, and also switch to exact phrase. 
I'm going to get 177 results, which isn't a lot given that there's 600,000 items, but it's still a lot for you to have to go through one by one and find um, the, the use of the term Tyson. If we try to if we try to search by last name, comma, first name with an exact phrase, we get zero results on that. Um, and that is in this particular instance. There are documents on the Arizona Memory Project where names are listed that way. We just saw one with that Yuma directory. So still try searching this way because you might find something you wouldn't find otherwise, but just know that not everything is going to be listed in this um, last name, comma, first name format. If we switch it around and do first name, last name, then we get eight results, which is a lot easier to search um, one by one through those documents. And then if we throw in a middle initial, we get an even more exact uh, result with just one record. So consider that when you guys are searching for names. I know most of you probably know this, um, this trick anyway, but it's worth reminding everyone that not names are not always listed the same way in every um, in every document um, for city directories. It's often last name and first name without the comma. And um, this particular flat platform will use the comma in its search results. So you might try using last name with no punctuation and first name as well. So just some ways that you guys can help us improve the Arizona Memory Project is assist us with some OCR correction. Um, again, this is an example of an important genealogic document that we don't have time to transcribe. Um, we do have, um, uh, uh, my mom actually will help us occasionally with transcribing some documents um, that we feel are important for genealogists, but we don't have time to find all of those out there. And you guys will probably come across those faster than we will. So if you find a document that you think could use some uh, improved OCR or transcribing, feel free to do that if you want. Um, you don't have to, we're not asking to, and there's not an easy way to do it in this platform. That's another thing that we are working on uh, improving in the future. Um, but the easiest way would be to just send us an email uh, with a link to the item that you are transcribing, and then just send us a plain old Word document um, with the text. It doesn't need any formatting or anything, just um, a Word document. And then we can replace that transcribe that transcript field with what you provide for us. Um, so if you do that, that would be uh, awesome and helpful for your fellow genealogists. Another way that you can help us is with material donation. Um, it's not something that we do very often, but this came up recently um, and provided us with some really cool stuff. Um, we had someone whose um, family member recently passed away and they had worked at the Arizona Biltmore in the 60s. And they gave us about 12 items that had been saved over the years, including this, which was the wine menu from probably 1959, 1960, somewhere in there. Um, so we digitized those few items and put those on the Arizona Memory Project because they're really fascinating. There's some menus and other things that, that were provided. So if you've collected things like that, um, reach out to us and we can talk about whether that's something that we collect. All of our collections have very specific collection development policies, so we might not be able to accept all things, um, but it is something that, um, you know, if you have a box of stuff that you've been saving and don't know where to take it to, um, contact us and we'll see if that's something that we can collect. It doesn't mean we will get it digitized right away. This one was really a bunch of small items, so it was really easy to do quickly. Um, but again, reach out to us if you have some stuff you th think might be of interest. And then another way is to become a partner with us. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have just now started working with um, families or private individuals with their collections, and this was the first one that we did. Um, it's the Silver Spur Ranch from the Sprague family collection. Their um, uh, ancestor, their grandfather, created this ranch, this resort ranch down near the Chiricahua Mountains, and they had guests there and, you know, took them on um, horseback rides and all kinds of things. And over the years, they had collected all of these photographs and ephemera and menus and things like that. Um, so they turned them into this collection that they shared with everyone in Arizona. Um, 
so that they could all see that. So if you have stuff like that, that is, um, you know, important to the history of Arizona and you want a place to showcase that stuff, um, we can do that for you. Just contact us about what it would be like to become a partner with us. We are not a preservation um, solution. So if you're looking for a place to preserve your photographs and throw away the physical format, that's not what we are. And we don't save the um, JPEGs and all that stuff. We're just a place for you to showcase that stuff, but definitely reach out to us because we would love to, um, you know, partner with families more. We know there's a lot of stuff out there that may not ever get found otherwise. And that's kind of all I had. Um, it's a lot of stuff. Uh, I went through it pretty quickly, but I appreciate you guys all being here, listening to me talk about the Arizona Memory Project, which I'm very passionate about. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at my email or the Arizona Memory at AZ Library email. That's the best way to reach me since we're not in the office uh, full time just yet. So try not to give me a call because um, I don't check my voicemail very often. Sorry. Um, and then also the the URL there is a way to reach all of the librarians at the, the library. Um, you can send us a question there and we can answer that question for you there. So thanks everybody. Well, interesting talks. I made a, a lot of notes and you have a lot of questions. Awesome. And that. So the first one that came in was the question about smaller newspapers or yes. smaller communities. Thank you. I actually even wrote a list during the last presentation. Um, so some of the smaller towns that we have, just I did a quick glance. The one that really stands out to me is from Ray, Arizona. And if you're familiar with mining history in Arizona, that city no longer exists because it was swallowed up by, um, I can't remember the name of the mine, but it's near Kearney. It no longer, the city no longer exists because it's down at the bottom of an open pit mine. So we have the Arizona Copper Camp which was a newspaper from there in the 20s, I believe. We have several newspapers out of Clifton, Safford, Globe, Florence, Parker. Um, we also have several newspapers from tribal communities. So not just cities, but um, the Papago Indian uh, News is out of Cells, Arizona. We have some out of Tuba City. Um, so we have a lot of smaller, um, smaller city newspapers. And that was a focus that we've um, tried to have in the last couple of years is getting those. Everyone wants the Arizona Republic um, because of the coverage that it had, but these smaller city newspapers are equally important. So, okay. So, the next one, and you kind of touched on this, the question was asked about someone has a postcard collection from 1907 to 1925, and they're looking for a place to preserve it. It's not her family. So, even though there's Arizona materials, is this something you want to look at? Or should I refer them? There is a site that does nothing more than preserve postcards, the front and the backs. Yeah, and we do the fronts and the backs also. We have quite a few postcards, um, not just from our own collections, but from um, we have partnered with the Postal History Foundation out of Tucson. Okay. They have lots of postcards also. Um, I would say just reach out to us and let's talk about what um, what you have and then we can go from there. Okay, so they will reach out to you, okay? So. Um, I had another question about the items um, free use or copyrighted. And I kind of responded saying, well, they're free for us to use, but okay. if you're going to use them other than personal research, you should always still get permission to use that. Is that your Most philosophy of the, that if they find something on your site and they're say publishing a book and they wanna use a couple images, they should write back to you? That would be the best thing to do because, you know, all of our stuff for the most part um, is out of copyright or it's a state government publication, meaning that it's free to the public. Um, uh, so the best thing would be to reach out to us. We do have people that want to use materials that come from our partners. And in that instance, we are not allowed to authorize that stuff. We would get you in contact with somebody um, from that partner institution. So if there was a photograph or something that you wanted from another partner of ours, we would get you in touch with that person. So just start by reaching out to us. The azmemory at azlibrary.gov email would be the easiest place to start. And then we can either, um, 
approve that ourselves or give you the correct person to do that. Okay. Um, the next one, this is actually mine. Um, under government records, do you have corporate reports or shareholder information on the various businesses in Arizona? We don't have, it wouldn't be under our government publications. Um, off the top of my head, I'm not sure that we have any shareholder reports or information. We might have some in the Arizona collection related to mines from okay. you know, the earlier days. But if there's something specific that you're looking for, shoot me an email and I can okay. do some. Because I know in Michigan, the state archives eventually gets those early corporate reports. And that's so I was just wondering. I'll send you an email offline. Yeah, and if we don't have, if the library doesn't have it, we work in the same building as the archives, we can shoot that question over to them. Someone that's probably ticked you off that day. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question uh, similar. Do you have newsletters from the Arizona Bank? Which would kind of go with, do you call it corporate newsletters? We do, and I know we have newsletters in our periodical collection from some of the banks, like maybe Valley National off the top of my head. I know I've seen some from some of the banks. So, yes, okay. it just depends on which bank. Okay, yes, so we do. just they need to dig down. Yeah. Okay. Um, Not on AMP, James? I should add that. Not on the Arizona Memory Project, but I know that we have them on the shelf for okay. some of the banks, yes. So, if they don't see it on Arizona memory project, they should not walk away making nope. the assumption. You guys just don't have it. It's just Correct. not on that platform. Correct. This is such a small amount of what we have in this gigantic warehouse that is temperature controlled. Um, very, very, very small amount of what we have in our physical collections. So, you guys can't wait until we just flood back into the library to drive <laughs> you guys nuts. We and, can't wait. <laughs> all right. Uh, the next one. Uh, David mentioned there was a question about uh, mining with such a large industry in Arizona. Do you have uh, industry publications for that industry? David uh, Rencher mentioned that Family Search has digitized mining records for Arizona. I'm believing that is through a partnership with you guys. So I'm not sure about those specific records. It could be that they got some from archives. Okay, um, but I do know that we have we have so much stuff on mining and a lot of it is not on the Arizona memory project. One of the things I know is, is the um, annual report of the mine inspector. And that does have some names in it because we have found some ancestors, um, some people searching for ancestors that knew that they died in a mining accident, but weren't sure. And that stuff is listed in the mine inspector report, like the list of people injured, the list of people who died. That is in those, um, especially the early reports. Obviously, once people became concerned about privacy, those names kind of right. stopped being printed. Um, but we do have those. I know we have some reports um, from specific mines, like maybe shareholder type uh, reports, annual reports from the mine itself. We do have some of those also. Um, okay. And then we have lots of government documents from mines and minerals, um, the mine inspector. We have lots of mining stuff. So the bottom line for the mining industry, you, they just need to check all the places. Yeah. In it. Okay. Yeah. And we have uh, newsletters also. Yeah. Let's see. Let me read this. Once you open a document in the collection and you go to the search function for names, I think you covered this. In other words, once you find the document you want and you open that document or file, you can search by name within it. Based right. on the guidelines you gave us. Right. In that upper left hand corner. Let me see if I can switch. Back this in this area. Okay. Yep. So that's where you're going to search. Now, let me ask a follow up question in that. So, is it better for us if we know, like, I want to look at this directory to pull that directory up and then drill down to the, to I would. the name issue or versus just. Hey, just send me everything back by name. I mean, if you know that you are looking, if you know you want to find something in a city directory, I would start there first uh -huh. and then find the information that you want. But then also do a broad Arizona Memory Project search because you might be surprised at where else that name, you know, shows up. Um, 
Yeah, okay. I mean, I would do both. If you know you want a city directory, start with the city directory so you avoid, you know, a longer list of results and then go back and see what else gets pulled up. I guess that's how I would, I would do okay. it. Okay. All right. Let me just uh, check real quick to make sure I've been trying to take notes and it's amazing because I really don't have Arizona old ancestors i've got recent ones but <laughs> god you're a wealth of knowledge um all right let me double check here a lot of resources a lot of links to catalogs um everyone thought you did a great job including me <laughs> and um, also um the handout that i provided has links to some of these specific things that we talked about but additional things also that I didn't have time to go over. So definitely start using those um, with using those resources. And uh, I think with that, since I see no more questions, thank you, Brandy, for a great talk. Thanks.